Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus in chapter number 2. As we have begun going through the book of Exodus on Sunday morning, we are in uh, chapter number 2 beginning in verse number 11. And when you found your place, if you're able, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Exodus in chapter number 2 and uh, beginning in verse number 11. I'll read aloud as you follow along. We're going to read all the way to the end of the chapter Exodus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. And the Bible says this, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killed the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And he said, An Egyptian, and they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have not that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gresham, and for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and they, their cry came up to God by reason of their bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Lord, I pray that you would help us today as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you would... Illuminate to us the truth. Lord, I I have nothing of any value to say, Lord, but your word is true. Lord, your word is powerful. Lord, it can change our life, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be ready and give permission, Lord, that we would open ourselves and our heart to the Holy Spirit, that as he instructs us and corrects us and guides us, Lord, we might yield to him so that we might be different because of the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. It is important for us to remember as we uh, go into this first part of Exodus, the things that we have discussed over the past few weeks. So uh, Egypt there in the book of Exodus represents the world, represents the flesh, represents the place of sin. And uh, God has been dealing specifically with them and, and responding to the obedience of the children of God. He first responded to the obedience of the Uh, of the ladies that would not kill the children. He responded to the midwives as they uh, obeyed God rather than obeying uh, Pharaoh. Then he responded, of course, to Moses' parents as they hid Moses and then placed him in that ark. And then God provided for Moses when Pharaoh's daughter came by and drew him out of the water. And so here we are in this position. Can I just stop here for a minute and and just remind you of this, and Brother Hitt's song uh, really points to this, a lot of times we really want to be in control. Don't you love being in control? Man, I love being in control. But can I tell you, there is no better place for yourself, for your family, for your children, than for God to be in control. What do you think uh, uh, Amram and Jochebed, the par- parents of Moses, would have rather done? Would they have rather to kept Moses and, and kept guard over him and kept watch over him? They would have no doubt rathered that. But you know what God wanted? God wanted to be in control of Moses' life. So here you see Moses' parents. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it was the faith of his parents that they took him and they placed him in that ark. 
Literally, they placed him in the ark, and all they did was had his sister watch from a distance, God, you're in control. Guess what happened? When they let God be in control, did God provide for Moses? Yes. You bet he did. Okay? Now here we are, that Moses is, or Pharaoh's daughter picks up Moses, and the babe wept, and she had compassion on him, and here comes Miriam, say, I know a Hebrew woman that will take care of this baby for you. And, and so now... Moses' mother is able to take care of uh, Moses for a while and to teach him and to, and to guide him. But pretty soon it comes time to take him to the palace. Would they have rather kept him for him themselves? No doubt. And be in control. Can I tell you, Moses would have been in greater danger under the control of his parents than under the control of God. So what did they do? They took him to the palace and they said, Okay, God. Did God provide for him? Sure. You bet he did. God took care of him. God used the things that his parents taught him, and he never forgot who he was. He never forgot his brethren. He never forgot those things. So now that he's grown, he's going, I'm going out to see my brethren. I'm going out to see what's going on. We might guess at his age, but we don't have to guess. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse number 23, Stephen says when he's 40 years old, He's 40 years old. Now he goes out to see the brethren. And this doesn't really have anything to do with the message. I just, man, I just want to be in control of all things. But I'm going to tell you it's better for God to be in control. Much better for God to be in control. And where God says let go, you let go. And where God says hold on, you hold on. But it's always better for God to be in control. And the influence of Moses' parents have... Have weighed, has uh, been effective, and, and he knows who he is. I'm going to say this a hundred times. Do not learn your Bible history from movies or television. Moses knew who he was. Okay? He goes out and he sees his brethren. Uh, that implies to me that even before he went out on his own, he hadn't taken notice of who they were and what was going on. And so here he goes out on his own. And Moses, catch this, Moses is desiring the right things, wants to do the right things, hopes to do the right things, plan on doing the right things. He wants to serve God. You say, how do you know that? The Bible even tells us there in the book of Acts. Even when this event, Moses supposed that his brethren would see that he did it for God. Let's turn there. Acts chapter number 7. So we can read it properly. Acts chapter number 7. Look what it says here. And even talking about this incident. In Acts and chapter number 7. Stephen is preaching. And preaching here to the Sanhedrin here in Acts 7. And look what it says here in verse. Beginning in verse number 23. Talking about, let's start in verse number 22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And was mighty in word and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, he came into his and came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffered wrong, he defended him and avenged him, and was oppressed and smote that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Now it's a pretty interesting uh, portion of scripture there. Now, he says, I went out there and, and I thought, man, I'm going to deliver them. What's Moses' desire? To do the right thing? Most definitely. He supposed that they would understood that God was going to have him deliver them. And so he goes out and he sees them fighting. He goes, he looks this way and he looks that way. Be careful of things you do right after you look this way and that way. Right? Right? <laughs> There's normally a reason you look this way and that way. Okay? He looks this way and that way to see if nobody's around. And he went and he took matters into his own hands. Do you know how often I do the wrong thing trying to do the right thing? I do the wrong thing trying to do the right thing. I take matters into my own hands. And he says, oh man, they're going to love this. Look what I just did. Did they understand it? They understood it not. Can I tell you, there is a right way to respond to conflict? There is a right way to respond to conflict. 
We have a problem. I'm just going to tell you, we have a problem in our Christian circles. And, and, and when we respond often to conflict with bitterness and anger and hate, we say, preacher, who's guilty of that? Well, that would be me. I've been guilty of that before. Okay, there's a right way to respond to conflict. There's a right way to operate when there is conflict. And so Moses goes out and he sees this uh, fight going on or the Egyptian hitting him. And he goes out and he looks this way and he looks that way and he goes ahead and he kills him. But can I tell you, when God is ordering and when God is in control, he does far better than when we are in control. Moses said, now, let's do it now. I would, I would have thought they knew God would send me to deliver them. Let's do it now. So Moses goes out and he sees this conflict. Bam! Looks this way and he hides him in the sand. Deliverance has come. Yeah, how many Egyptians did Moses kill in his own strength? One. How many Hebrews did Moses save in his own strength? One. Any idea how many Egyptians God killed through Moses? The whole army. We'll get there a little bit later. Do you know how many Hebrews God saved when Moses walked in obedience and waited on God? The whole nation. Here's what happens when we respond. Can I tell you whether we respond to conflict or whether we just respond in our own flesh? We think, here we go, we're going to do this. Yeah, you might do something, but it's not going to be what God wants. Of what value was this? Hey, there was, a, there was a value. You say, well, should I respond to conflict? Sure, sure I should. Is it inter- it, it, did it ever wonder to you why God included this little story about the daughters of the priests of Midian at the well? I mean, he could have said he ran away from Pharaoh, and he went to Midian, and he hooked up with this guy named Jethro, Raul, the priest of Midian. But it adds this other little story in it, doesn't it? Look what it says. Let's look what it says as he flees. It says, the priests, verse 16, now the priests of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. Apparently this happened often. Because what did their father say when they came back? How come you came back so soon today? Normally this takes a lot longer. Can you imagine these Lazy men, that's a different sermon, but I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of lazy men letting women do all the work. Okay, And these shepherds would sit and watch, and these women would come and draw the water for their father's flock. No problem with that. They're out working, and they're drawing water for their father's flock. These shepherds are sitting back with their flock going, hold on, boys. Not quite enough water yet. Hold on. All right, it's filled. And they would take their flocks down there and drive these girls away. Their flocks would have a nice full drink, and then they say, have a great day, and the girls would have to draw water again for their father's flocks. That's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, most certainly. That's a conflict. Okay? And Moses comes in, and he sees this, and he sees this conflict, but he responds differently than he did to the previous conflict. You say, well, how do you know that? His first resolution of conflict did not bring him gratitude but brought him criticism. Isn't that what happened after he killed the Egyptian? He came out the next day, and there's these two Hebrews fighting. He's like, guys, guys, easy. What are you so upset about? And they said, excuse me? Who made you ruler over? Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Do you think perhaps Moses killed the Egyptian with a little bit of anger? Do you think perhaps Moses... Might even have thought, here we go. He did look this way and that way. He probably could have solved the conflict a different way. The Bible says that he was mighty in word and deed. So here we are, the second conflict, and he resolves it differently. He still stood up for what was right. He still stood up for those that were were being abused. He still stood up for those. He did what was right, but he did in a way that brought about gratitude and not fear. And so here we are in this situation, two illustrations of conflict. And I would venture to think that God includes a second illustration to help us know there is a right way to deal with conflict. Hey, you see somebody that's being oppressed. You see somebody that's going through... 
stand up. But there is a right way. You, is, you do see somebody that is, their lives have been uh, completely destroyed by sin and they, they find themselves in the, gra- uh, the gravity of sin and their, their lives are being torn apart and I want to stand up and say, that's the wrong thing to do. There is a right way to confront people. Have you ever had to apologize to your children when they were the ones that were disobedient? They were disobedient and you corrected them in such a way that you ended up having to apologize to them. That's a bummer. You know? They didn't take out the trash, or they didn't do this, or they didn't do that. And you get so in the flesh and so angry that you're telling them and you ended up using things and saying things that you probably you shouldn't say. And, oh, I can't believe you. you. You're a worthless bum, you know, and all this stuff. Why can't you just do one thing right? And then you end up having to go back and say, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have blown my temper like that. Listen, when you respond wrong... The person that was in the wrong gets away with it. (laughs) This Hebrew guy, it it clearly points out to us when these two Hebrews were in conflict, it was the one that was in the wrong that said, well, you made you the judge over us. Are you going to kill us too? And Moses had to flee. The guy that was in the wrong, we don't even think about him. Because Moses had lost his temper. Moses had taken matters into his own hands. Now don't miss this. He was trying to do the right thing. He wanted to do the right thing. He desired to do the right thing. But he did the right thing the wrong way. He did the right thing in anger. He did the right thing and it did not accomplish God's plan. And in fact, he finds himself... Having to leave Egypt. You say, well, isn't this all in the plan of God? Yes. Do you think God can ever use your mistakes in His plan? Have you read the book of Revelation? He uses the whole world's mistake in His plan. God knows. God is a sovereign God. He knows what's going to happen. And even those things that are done... All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Yes, God is going to use this in Moses' life. But here we have two pictures of two conflicts. One where Moses responds in one way, and the second where Moses responds produces gratitude from the one that he defended, from the one he took care of. How careful we must be in trying to operate and trying to help those who are in Egypt. You ever met somebody who's living in Egypt? I'm talking about living in the world, living in sin. Hey, Brother Hit's song is so true. Guess where I came from? I came from Egypt. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm just a sinner that has been saved by the grace of God. Praise the Lord. And I meet somebody that comes from my hometown. Right off the coast of the Nile. Right off the side of the Nile. And I meet him. How do I get him out of Egypt? Well, here, Moses is going to use the sword, so to speak, or God's plan is to use the staff. Ultimately, it will be the use of the staff that will bring them out of Egypt. You ever, I don't know if you've ever done some research on the shepherd's staff, but it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting how the staff would be used to direct the sheep. The staff would be used to correct the sheep. The staff would be used to protect the sheep. Not often was the staff used to kill the sheep. Sometimes when we meet people in Egypt, maybe because we're taking matters into our own hands, we use the staff to beat them over the head. Yeah, but somebody's got to condemn them. Uh, Actually, they're condemned already. You don't have to condemn them. They're not condemned by my law. They're condemned by the law of God. What they need is recognition of that condemnation and how they can make their way out of Egypt and find forgiveness and salvation and restoration. And that's the job of the staff is to direct and to guide and correct. Sometimes we go to battle with a sword. We should be going to battle with the staff. Say, well, what about the word of God? Oh, most certainly. God's word is sharp. 
God's word is sharp. But guess, guess who's ultimately going to pierce the heart? It's going to be God through the Holy Spirit. And so here Moses responding to two conflicts, and he finds himself now in the wilderness. You ever found yourself waiting on God? I don't mean in an Isaiah chapter 40 way. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I mean waiting on God like this. Come on, let's go. He said, how do you know Moses was waiting on God? The Bible says in the book of Acts that when this event happened, Moses supposed that they would understood that God had sent them to him to deliver them. Now, he's 40 years old. He's running from Pharaoh. He finds himself here in the land of Midian. And guess what he does? Waits. Now, we can learn some lessons from Moses here, you know what it says about us, look, look, about Moses? Look what it says here in verse number 20, 21. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. Man, can I tell you, that's a lesson we need to learn from Moses. Contentment while we wait. We are so impatient. I, okay, I am so impatient. I don't know if you are, but I am. Even for good things. You ever try to build a church building? <laughs> so impatient. You know what happens? Sometimes you take matters into your own hands. And it makes things longer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this sermon's just for me. Come on. We wait on the Lord. And we're like, but Moses was content to wait. It's kind of interesting. You have to. Look at the whole thing. Verse number 21. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses, Zipporah, his daughter. When you read the scripture, you have to make sure you use scripture to interpret scripture. How old was Moses when he got there? 40 years old. How old was Moses when he left? 80 years old. And how old were his children when he left? Very young. Because if you remember... We're going to have an incident about the circumcision of one of his boys when he's leaving to go back to Egypt. We read it. This is this how we read it. Save the woman from the well. Meet Jethro. Hey, Dad, here's the poor. Let's get married. <laughs> he was content to dwell and watch the sheep. It, apparently, there's some time that goes by before this marriage actually takes place. Because when he's leaving... His children are still very young. Still very young. So he's content to wait on God. Not just on the plan of God for deliverance, but he's content to wait on God for the plan of God for his family. He's content to wait on the plan of God for what he's going to do. And what is he doing this whole time? Keeping sheep. And I think to myself, what a waste of time. I mean, you spend 40 years, Moses, in a wilderness, backside of the desert, chapter 3, verse 1 says, you spend 40 years in a wilderness keeping sheep. Now, what good is that going to do you? You know what Moses will be doing for the rest of his life? In the wilderness, keeping sheep, called the children of Israel. Sometimes we get ahead of God. In our plan, we get ahead of God. Sometimes based upon our own evaluation of our importance. Sometimes based upon what we think can and should be accomplished. Come on, let's go. Let's, this has to happen. God says, you know what I'd rather you do? I'd rather you keep sheep for a while. You remember, it's God is going to be the one that comes in the burning bush, right? It'll be God that will finally say, Moses, let's go. It wasn't that Moses is sitting there and God's going, I've been waiting on you for 40 years. God says, now is the time. Now is the time. There's been some preparation that has taken place. There's been some... How much, how much do you think Moses learned watching sheep in the wilderness? Can I tell you, growing up in Egypt, he was educated with the wisdom of Egypt. You know how much Egypt taught him about keeping sheep? Nothing. Egyptians hated shepherds. They hated them, which brought about the initial conflict 
That's why the children of Israel were placed over in Goshen. So they wouldn't be near to where so the Egyptians could see them keeping sheep. They didn't like shepherds. So what was Moses taught about sheep? Nothing. Which is probably a good thing. If you're going to be a shepherd, who should probably teach you about keeping sheep? Yeah, the shepherd. Jethro. Sometimes we, learn, we try to learn to do the things of God from Egypt. Don't try to learn to do the things of God from Egypt. It doesn't work. They don't know anything about keeping sheep. I remember when we started the church, and people were giving me, read this book about church growth. Read this book about starting a church. And I'm reading it, and it was all about marketing. Marketing. What's the next chapter? Marketing. Wow. Do something outlandish so you get noticed. Nothing about keeping sheep. They don't know anything about keeping sheep. And so here he is on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Content to learn. Do you think the things that he learned there in Midian was a help in the wilderness of Sinai? You bet it was. You bet it was. We look at the situation and go, well, there was a waste of 40 years. And God says, that wasn't a waste. I'm instilling in you some things. Moses, you better learn to learn before you learn to lead. Moses, you better learn what it is to keep sheep. You better learn what it is to be under the authority of somebody else. Moses there in Egypt, he was a prince of Egypt. He came out and this appears to be, to me, the attitude that is displayed from the other Hebrews. Moses came out and he said, I'll take care of this. And they said, who do you think you are? Our prince? In the book of Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen says, they said, who do you think you are, our judge and our ruler? Apparently this is what Moses gave off. Moses said, here we go, I'll lead. God says, uh, why don't you learn to learn first before you learn to lead? Now, let me qualify something. Forty years in Moses' life doesn't necessarily translate to forty years in your life. Isn't that a blessing? Right? Well, preacher said we need to learn, so I'll take the next 40 years. No, 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 no. He learned until God showed up in the bush. If God had shown up in the bush after six months, guess what? It would have been time to go. The key there is waiting on the Lord. The key there is being able to spend that time. He was in an environment where it was... It was uh, acceptable and it was cultivated to hear from God. Here he was in an environment where he was learning and preparing. He, do you think no, Moses knew all the things that he was preparing for? You think he woke up and said, okay, I'm going to watch these sheep because 40 years from now, I'm going to take 2 million people into the wilderness. No, it wasn't his plan. It was God's plan. If it was Moses' plan, he probably would have invaded Egypt. Instead of using his mouth. Remember the problem he had with God saying, he said, God, I can't speak like that. God said, listen, it's my plan. Say, wait wait a second, preacher. I thought it was my life. Not if you're a child of God. The Bible says you've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your mind, which are his. And here he is waiting. Perhaps he was waiting because God needed to temper his anger into meekness. You know what the Bible says about Moses? He was the meekest man, the most meek. Where do you think he learned meekness? Not fighting Egyptians. He learned it in the wilderness. Moses was a meek man. Maybe God was preparing him, changing his temperament. I know I've heard this a bunch of times and I've probably been guilty of it. You ever heard this statement? Well, that's just the way I am. Well, that's just the way I am. Moses could have said that. When I see conflict, here we go. That's just the way I am. God said, well, let me see how long it's going to take for me to change the way you are. Into what I want you to be. 40 years. (laughs) 40 years. I've used this illustration before, but growing up, I had such a 
competitive spirit. I was so competitive. If there was a badminton tournament on television, I would watch it and get into it, you know, because I was so competitive. And that competitiveness would immediately translate, when things didn't go my way, to anger. That's how it would translate, from competitiveness to anger. And I remember being at a church volleyball tournament and things not going my way. And there's 150 people around me. And I'm arguing and yelling at the pastor. And I look around and everybody's going, hmm? Oops. Go forward a couple years. I'm playing softball. I'm all competitive and I miss the ball and I throw my glove on the ground and kick it for a while and come over and sit down in the dugout and I'm all upset. And one of the teenagers that I've been teaching comes around to the back side of the fence. He didn't come inside the dugout. He knew better. He came around to the back side of the fence and he said, Brother Roster, when you're preaching about testimony, is this what you're talking about? <laughs> it's a good thing there was a fence there. Yeah. And I was angry. I wasn't really angry at him. He's just a smart aleck. I was angry at me. So compa- I don't know how many times I'd gotten into arguments and anger and oh, it was. I said, Lord, please, I need victory over this. I need help. Now, I still have the ability. Moses will still have the ability to get angry. Read Numbers chapter number 20. Why should we fetch water out of this walk for, for, rock for ye rebels? He still has the ability to get angry. But God changed him from a person that is known for anger to a person that is known for meekness. And by God's grace... I can play a game, a sports game, and I'm going to try my best, and I still like to win, but if I lose, it's okay. If my teammate messes up, not a problem. Say, wow, you must be special. No, no, I'm telling you, God changed my heart. God literally changed my heart. But in order for for him to do that, I had to be confronted a couple times. I had to be confronted about that. And here Moses is on the backside of the desert. You say, we gotta, but wait a second, preacher. While all this is happening, people are hurting. You're right. Which brings us to verse number 23. Look what it says. And it came to pass in the process of time. You say, wouldn't it have been better for Moses to go right back to Egypt? What, to kill one more Egyptian? It'd be better to wait on the plan of God. Because while God was preparing Moses, God was also preparing the children of Israel. He was telling the children of Israel, I'm waiting to hear you cry. I'm waiting to hear you cry. I'm waiting for you to ask me to deliver you. Look what it says here in verse number 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up to God by reason of their bondage. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. While we are busy learning, let me always remind you, God never forgets. While we're busy getting trained and we're busy uh, having things fixed in our life, and God never forgets. He did not forget his covenant. He did not forget his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know who he's waiting on? He was waiting on the cry. He was waiting on the cry. You know why some people haven't put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ yet? They've not found themselves in a position where they need to cry out to God. They still think they can figure it out on their own. They still think they might have enough good deeds in order to earn a place in heaven. Nowhere in the Bible are you going to find a place where a person can earn their way to heaven. That's why Jesus died for us. We're like, come on, why don't they get it? Well, because God's still waiting for them to cry. You remember when you got saved? In the process, the things that went on? How come you didn't get saved earlier? Well, probably you weren't ready to cry. I tell you, it's a blessing. Some people hear the gospel and they're like, man, I want that. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Man, what a humble heart. And there must be humility. Others of us are like, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll fix this first. Maybe I'll change this first. Maybe God will ask too much of me. Whatever their reason, they're not ready to cry yet. God does not save people who, not, who do not cry out for salvation. He doesn't. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, under, uh, is made unto righteousness, and with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And so there has to be that cry to God. So here's Israel. Their, their existence is miserable, and they know it. But they're not quite ready to cry. But can I tell you, God's timing is perfect. Absolutely. Always perfect. What He needs is servants who are willing to yield themselves to His timing. Look at this. Moses has gone through 40 years of training in the wilderness. At the same time, we have another 40 years of oppression upon the children of Israel. The king that knew Moses, that had the direct conflict with him, has now passed off the scene. And while Moses is done with his training, the children of Israel, fed up, begin to cry out to God. The Egyptian obstacles move out of the way. God says, I'm going to light me a bush. It's time. And God's timing is always perfect. So what's my job, preacher? What am I supposed to do? Well, let me tell you what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to allow yourself to be changed by the Word of God. Allow yourself to be changed by the Word of God. I remember meeting a, meeting a preacher who had told me a story about a man who just recently got saved and the man came into the preacher's office he says here's what i want to know i want to know what god wants me to do and how god wants me to live my life and the preacher said you want the fast track or the short track or the slow track the man said i want the fast track give it to me and it was amazing how fast that man changed you know why he looked for change he desired change some of us we want change, but we don't want any training to take place. We don't want any time on the desert. We want to spend all our time in the palace of Egypt and learn how to be the shepherd of God's people. Doesn't work that way. You know how silly that is? That's like going on a diet and eating a Dunkin' Donuts every day. <laughs> Stiff, stuffing down that third donut. So how are you? I'm on a diet. Hoping to lose some weight. What are you doing? Only six donuts instead of 12. <laughs> it's not going to work. You're going to have to spend some time in the desert or away from dessert, however you spell it. You're going to have to spend some time allowing there to be change. Craving it. Desiring it. Looking for it. And God will change you. God will change you. Before change can ever take place, you must first be his child. You must first be his child. You have to put your faith and trust in God. And as a Christian, sometimes we're going, yeah, but there's so much to do and there's so much to be accomplished. You let God take care of that. You let God change you. You let God affect you. And while Moses was there, he wasn't idle. He had defended these daughters. He learned to obey authority. He learned to tend sheep. He learned to exist in the wilderness. And he learned to hear from God. Man, what a blessing. What a blessing. Those 40 years are going to prepare him for the next 40 years. Sometimes, I, unfortunately, I have been the kind of Christian, I've known the kind of Christian, where they could go 40 years, but they are no different than they were 40 years ago. And instead of waiting on God, now God's waiting on them. And God would love to do something in their heart. But they're enjoying the palace of Egypt too much. And all the things that Moses did wrong, don't get this confused. When he was grown, he said, I want to go see the burden of my people. He didn't do things perfectly. And God said, ah, 
now I'll create in you what I want you to be. And God used him in a mighty way. Imagine if Moses had just stood in the palace, forgotten the people, enjoyed, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, enjoyed the pleasures of sin. No, no, he didn't enjoy the pleasures of sin. He forsook Egypt, not fearing Pharaoh. And as a Christian, you know what this world needs? They need to see Christians who are allowing God to change their life. Using the word of God to change their life. So that when God's ready to use them to change other people's lives, they're an instrument of use. They're an instrument that can be used. You know, at the most, I'll close with this illustration. I talk to a lot of people. Talking door knocking, witnessing. I talk to a lot of people. You know, the most common thing I hear from people that don't go to church or, or they're not believers. When they tell me about Christians... They say they're angry and they're hypocrites. And I tell them, I I try to come back to them and say, well, actually you're right, we all are hypocrites in some way because we're not perfect. But we shouldn't, I don't really have a defense for being angry. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The Bible talks about us, us having joy unspeakable. And full of glory. How does God want us to operate? He wants us to operate where we can deal with conflict and still praise His name. He wants us to operate where we wait on Him. He changes us. He molds us. And then when He says go, we're ready to go. Because the work of God will be much more accomplished, will be always greater accomplished when it's His work and not our work. My greatest prayer is as the Lord allows us, you know, we always talk about the building. We get in the building. You know what my greatest prayer is? God, always help us to know we're weak. And we're nothing without you. Without you, we are nothing. As soon as we go, you know what church I pastor? I pastor the church with a building. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. That's when I start taking matters into my own hands. And I might kill an Egyptian here or there. I might save a Hebrew here and there. But nothing like God wants. Nothing like God wants. You ever hear somebody say, Oh, America is beyond hope. There's no way to save a nation. You're right, because a lot of times we just have Christians that are just out there swinging at people. Instead of letting God change them, being an example to a nation... Who knows what God could do if we would let him change us. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, as we look at this, these uh, stories here of real people that existed and went through real situations. Lord, your Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians that they are our example. And they can help us learn how to live the Christian life. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be able to deal with conflict in a way that glorifies you. That you might help us learn to to wait on you and trust in you and, and allow you to, to train us. Even though we may not be in a, in a leadership capacity yet, we may not be in a position where we are uh, to be noticed yet, well, there still can be training and there still can be learning where you're getting us ready. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to desire that change. Lord, and maybe there would be some here today that if they were honest, they don't even know where they would spend eternity. If they died today, they don't know if they'd go to heaven or hell. Lord, that's the very first change you want to bring about in someone's life. That they can know that they know that they know that their sins are forgiven. That they're a child of God. Lord, I pray that you'd help us.